Welcome everybody to the uh, HDI webinar. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined so far. Hopefully we've got some folks kind of in the Pacific area who are joining at what might be an early hour for you, but appreciate you joining in. Um, my name is Brian Benish <coughs> uh, with uh, well, DSIAC and HDIAC. Um, so John Clements, who is the presenter for this webinar, uh, is the HDIAC tech lead. Um, but before we get into his presentation, I did want to give a, a quick introduction to HDIAC um, and then a little bit about the webinar logistics before we get going. So uh, HDIAC, for those who aren't aware, is the Homeland Defense and Security IAC Information Analysis Center. Uh, the IACs <coughs> are a DOD entity. Uh, we're uh, kind of a government-owned, contractor-operated type organization, um, developed uh, organizationally under DTIC, the Defense Technical Information Center. Um, and we are designed to support the DoD uh, research and engineering community by conducting information research on a variety of technical topics. Uh, for HDI, that would be the technical topics within the Homeland Defense and Security domain. Um, within our, our organization, our group, we've got technical folks on staff who can help you find information on any of these technical topics within the Homeland Defense and Security domain. And um, ultimately, we exist to help make sure that the work that is being done in that DoD research and engineering community um, is, is not being duplicated. Um, or if there is similar work efforts being done, we can help foster some collaboration throughout the DoD community. Um, and so we host these webinars as a way to kind of put out, push out an awareness of information um, that is kind of out there and or work being done in that, that DOD community. And so glad to have John here to kind of push out his research and findings on this topic. Um, and so before we begin, uh, just a couple notes here about the webinar uh, logistics for those who are in the any meeting platform. Um, first, you should be able to uh, see the slides. If you do have any technical difficulties uh, seeing any of the slides, uh, you can either uh, dial in to uh, the, the phone line that's provided, and that phone number should be on the HDI website for this particular webinar. Um, and then you can also on that same web page download the slides so you can kind of follow along uh, with the slides you've downloaded while listening to the audio. Um, and also, if you do have any other technical difficulties, just rest assured this is being recorded and we'll make this available after the fact or uh, later viewing. Um, for those who are in the AnyMeeting platform online, you can submit questions, and I would encourage you to do that. You can do that at any time during the presentation. At the top middle of your screen is a little dialog box uh, that you can click on to submit a question. And so, again, and submit those at any time during the presentation. And at the end, we will uh, go through the Q&A kind of in the order that they were received. Uh, I do want to distinguish that, though, from the chat. Um, so, if you, again, if you're in the web platform, you'll notice there's a chat on the left-hand side. Uh, feel free to use that, but just be uh, forewarned that that is primarily for trying to communicate with us in real time during the presentation. If you do want to submit a question, I would strongly encourage you to make sure you do that through the, the question portal uh, form that you can access that little dialog box again at the top middle of the screen. Okay, so uh, that is about it introduction-wise. I will let John uh, kind of introduce himself, the topic, and uh, take the remainder of the time. John, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Brian. So as Brian said, uh, my name is John Clements. I am now the technical lead for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center. Uh, this, my contact information is up there. Uh, you can get me at john.clements at dsiac.org. As Brian said, we are a uh, contractor run organization and um, our company held the DSIAC uh, contract prior to getting the contract for all three IACs. Um, so I had a dsiac.org email address when I created the slides, but recently I've been blessed with also an hdiac.org email address. So you can get me at hdiac.org as well. Um, and also on that right now, because of the migration to 0365, I don't have access to my mail.mil. So the, there's, there's two email addresses you can get me at. One of them is correct up on the screen, the other one at hdiac.org, john.clemens at hdiac.org. Um, with that being said, uh, just a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I have um, 20, 20 years of experience in the United States Marine Corps. I'm still serving in the reserves. Uh, I am actually out in a, what's called an IMA billet, an individual mobilization augmentee billet out at Marine Forces Pacific. Um, 
when um, my company got the contract to run the HDI Act portion of the information analysis centers, I was actually out in Hawaii and um, it was actually Brian and our director had said, Hey, what would you do if you had, if you wanted to produce a webinar? And um, if anybody's from the Indo-PACOM AOR, you will recognize uh, the title, the tyranny of distance in Homeland defense. Um, the tyranny of distance was being beaten to my head. Uh, the Homeland Defense mission in the Indo-PACOM AOR uh, was near and dear to me from previous experiences. So uh, um, that was something I went, I just sunk my teeth into, and that is the genesis of this webinar presentation. Um, so welcome all to the Tyranny of Distance in Homeland Defense. Uh, we're going to be focusing on weapons of mass destruction response in the uh, Pacific Territories or the U.S. Indo-PACOM AOR. So there's two combatant commands with a Homeland Defense mission. We have U.S. Northern Command, which has the obvious mission with its AOR being the continent, including the continental United States. Now, Alaska as well, as well as uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands fall within that sphere. Uh, but also U.S. Indo-PACOM. Um, some people are a little surprised to realize when they realize that the PACOM has Indo-PACOM has a homeland defense mission. So today I want to discuss that homeland defense mission in the islands of the Pacific, which includes the state of Hawaii, uh, the territories of Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands and the American Samoa, as well as three countries, three sovereign states that are in a compact of free association with the United States. That being Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So the United States is responsible for the defense of those three sovereign nations, and therefore they fall under the Homeland Defense mission set for Indo-PACOM as well and U.S. Uh, Army Pacific and the other components out there. Um, they lack all three of those nations lack any internal military forces, but their citizens are free to join the U.S. military. And uh, I will touch on that a little bit uh, later on in the presentation, but there's fewer uh, restrictions on citizens of those three nations joining the U.S. military as opposed to other nations around the world. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, um, so this presentation is going to be very high level. I, I am going to speak in a lot of generalities that uh, may be somebody with, a, with an intense, deep understanding in the seabird world might say, well, that's not always true. Or, you know, somebody who understands a lot of the nuances in these different island nations may say, well, that, that's not necessarily always the case. I'm bringing forth some general generalities uh, in a weapons of mass destruction, namely a chemical and radiological event on these islands. And I really... It's not so much a technical presentation as something that's going to provoke some thought for some people and and uncover some things that I've learned for researching this topic that I think, you know, bears some additional thought more than what has been given to it thus far. So I'm going to move on to the next slide here. And this is a simple map, which was taken from my go-to since the seventh grade, the CIA World Factbook. Um, but this is a map of Oceania, and which includes all of the Pacific territories. Uh, but is, as you say, it's, it's more focused on the South Pacific Ocean than the uh, North Pacific Ocean. But uh, we have our territories primarily cut a swath through the Central Pacific. Um, but this slide is basically here to show the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. And I got some approximate straight line distances labeled there. So first in the uh, upper right, so the northeast corner, you have the state of Hawaii. So it's by far the closest of all of our Pacific Island um, territories uh, in, to the continental United States. But it's still nearly 2,600 miles from Los Angeles, the largest city, the closest big city and airport to Hawaii. Um, and that 2,600 miles is is to approximately to Oahu. Uh, to put this into context, New York and Los Angeles are only about 2,500 miles apart. So you have the distance of the continental United States to cross just to get any type of response to 
the state of Hawaii. So looking at some of the territories in the region, all the way over uh, to the northwest, you have our two territories of Guam and the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, or CNMI. Uh, they are part of the same archipelago of islands geographically. However, they're administered as two separate um, two separate territories. Um, of note here is that CNMI does not have its own national guard. Now, what that the islanders or, or residents of CNMI can join the Guam National Guard, but obviously you have some distance to travel uh, if you were to need to report to Guam for a response on another island or whatever. There's logistics involved in just one single soldier or airman responding um, to any type of event. And with that, the reason I bring up the National Guard is Almost all National Guards in the United States, in the 50 states, the D.C., Puerto Rican National Guard, and the Guam National Guard all have what's called a civil support team. And that is a team of 22 personnel that um, are dedicated to uh, assisting civil authorities with a, um, a WMD event. And they have uh, a large array of detection capabilities, some mitigation capabilities. But it's important to remember, A, that's only 22 people. So in a large scale event, they're going to be quickly overwhelmed. Um, they will be able to detect what is there, hopefully provide some level of fidelity on what we're dealing with from a perspective of what type of agent we may be encountering. Um, but again, it's only 22. There's only so much they're going to be able to do. And B, uh, as I said, CNMI has no National Guard, so they lack a civil support team. There's three sovereign nations across the middle of the Pacific there have no National Guard, and neither does American Samoa. Um, so I just wanted to point out that issue with the civil support teams. Um, so again, going back to uh, the territories to round it out, we have American Samoa you see down there in the southeast. Again, with that straight line distance, it's another 2,600 miles from Hawaii. Um, and that is, again, double the distance from continental United States because chances are anything coming in, any response to America Samoa is probably going to originate in Hawaii or perhaps an allied nation nearby. But that is, again, I, I'm not getting into that level of response with this. Um, but you're talking two 2,600-mile hops to get anything that must come from the continental United States to American Samoa. Um, so then you have the three uh, nations that are in the compact of free association with the United States. And that is Palau, uh, all the way to the west, the Federated States of Micronesia, they're kind of in the center, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands in the east. Uh, the largest I island is in Palau, and that is the island of Tual, and uh, I've heard several different pronunciations on that, so I'm going to go go with that. Babel Tual in Palau is 143 square miles, so it sounds like a larger island, but that's about the size of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, the largest island in the Marshalls is Kwajalein Atoll, which comes in at about six square miles. So you're talking that that entire island group there, right in the center of the map. The largest island is six square miles. And uh, there's 4,500 miles separating Babel Tawal, Palau from Oahu, and about 800 miles from that same island in Palau back to Guam, the nearest large uh, territory, I guess you could say, or larger island. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overlay of what we're dealing with. And that is where the term, the tyranny of distance, has been coined. Is is just anything that involves the Pacific Ocean, automatically you're adding five, six, seven thousand miles to something that might be within, you know, a, sh a short driving distance on the continental United States. And that's for any type of any event, military, civilian, or otherwise. Moving on. So. This presentation is going to be part geography lesson, as I said, and we're going to um, look at each area to kind of point out a couple of key indicators 
in their logistical capabilities. The indicators I picked are the simple ones of runway length, seaport size, and hospital bed capacity. Those are very broad indicators. And of course, there's dozens of other markers out there as to what, um, what the logistical capabilities of an area are, such as maintenance facilities available, offload equipment available, the type and quantity of medical equipment on site are accessible. But these few markers I'm gonna to use to make some general inferences on the logistical and medical support available at each particular location. So the state of Hawaii here is, uh, would be the linchpin of any homeland defense response in the Pacific. But um, the island of Oahu is very densely populated. You see it up there in the Northeast screen. For a lot of you that have spent time out at Indo-PACOM, you will understand um, how densely populated Oahu is. And on top of that, and something that you must keep in the back of your mind when we're going through all of these different islands is the number of tourists that you're going to have. And those tourists, these islands are very popular destinations for, um, for the Asian continent. So you're going to have Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Koreans, um, all people from the other islands all coming together in this area. And, um, so it's going to create many logistical challenges, cultural challenges also to, um, to be being able to initiate any type of response. Um, so Oahu, uh, it's obviously it has the state capital of Honolulu, the headquarters of Indo-PACOM, many other U.S. military bases for all branches of service. Uh, has has a, lo the, a large international airport, one of the largest ports of any of the territories, and of course, Pearl Harbor Naval Base and several other installations, as I mentioned. Uh, spread out throughout the island is over 1,600 hospital beds, um, whereas many of the islands we're going to be talking about only have one hospital, and, uh, and several of them only ha are served by a clinic, and anything more than what would be a routine doctor visit anywhere on the continent of the United States, anything above that has to be transported off island. Um, so uh, moving on, I'll look at the, uh, the big island, the island of Hawaii down south. So this has a couple of unique features to it. Uh, a, it's larger size. Um, and B, it is bisected by a couple of large mountains, which create, which gives you both a benefit and a curse. You know, the mountains that run through the center of it, in one way, the wind, which would normally take a some you know a chemical threat or radiological particles or something would normally take it from east to west following the prevalent trade winds will be blocked in that center part of the island uh, for the most part um, to some degree I should say but that also creates a those mountains also create some bottlenecks to getting any type of personnel equipment into those areas um, luckily it has an airport on either side of the island. Um, it does have uh, approximately 225 hospital beds that are um, in a couple different hot locations on the island um, and uh, several other smaller airfields that aren't, that aren't listed here on the slide. Um, and then lastly, I'll touch on Maui. Uh, Maui does have 219 hospital beds, but they are pretty much condensed into one area. Um, its port facility is very small despite its population and the number of tourists that it gets. Remember, Maui's a very popular tourist destination. Uh, so the affected number of people is going to be much greater than population numbers would indicate. Um, and then all the remaining islands have very small airports, uh, very small hospitals. You see some of the numbers in red there is the number of hospital beds. If Lanai only has 14 um, and very small ports. Um, another thing that I want to bear in mind as we go through all of these is that, for example, here in Hawaii, o Oahu could facilitate a major response, but a major event on Oahu would have to be primarily handled on island. And the thing is, these events could be impacting the very resources that are needed to, um, to respond to them. So a lot of the islands, the airport, the seaport, and the hospitals, and the major population is all in one small area of the island. So if you have a major event in that area, it is going to 
uh, hamper your response bravely. So now that we we have, uh, we'll go through some of the other islands. I'll make sure it's a little faster here. Hawaii being, you know, one of the largest populations and, and being the first one kind of took a little longer, but now we're getting to Guam. Uh, so Guam is one of those islands where the airport, the major seaport, and a lot of the population are all kind of clustered together in the center part of the island. And oh yes, by the way, right there at Hagatna, the capital of Guam, is a choke point to get from the north side to the south side of the island. It is only about four miles wide there. Um, Guam is 30 miles if you measure it from about the uh, northeast to the southwest tips of the island. Um, uh, as I, I already went over that, the, you know, the hospitals and the airport and all that are kind of centrally located. The numbers there, you see the 42 and the, I believe it's 198. Yes. Um, those are the two separate hospitals. They're relatively close together. And the 42 is the, uh, the Naval hospital on Guam. And it, actually a lot of, several of those beds are, uh, are designated labor and delivery beds. Um, for the for the military personnel there with their families, so um, you have beds, but again, different capabilities for for different reasons. Uh, so, in addition, the population density of Guam is about a hundred, or I'm sorry, it's eight hundred nine per square mile. Uh, there's one hundred sixty seven thousand people on Guam itself. Uh, to put that into some perspective, again, this is uh very generalized but pennsylvania my home state only has 284 people per square mile because you know we jokingly call it pennsylvania you have philadelphia pittsburgh and kind of nothing in the middle um but it's uh you know overall it's less densely populated than guam so now we come to the commonwealth of the north mariana islands uh, again sitting just north of of Guam. So Guam would be just off the southern part of this map a little bit. Um, and you see here some of the numbers. So you have the, the island of Rhoda uh, has a fairly short runway, 6,000 foot runway, um, only a 10 patient clinic. Saipan, by far the largest of the islands in population size, and I believe also in, in uh, geographical area. Uh, Saipan has 86 hospital beds, and that's kind of the island where People from the other islands would be sent to Saipan for additional hair, uh, care. Uh, and then Tinian has a small five patient clinic. So, again, looking at something like Tinian, you really don't have any medical support in Tinian or Rhoda, despite thousands of people living on those two islands combined. Um, so, I, I already met, as I already mentioned, CNMI has no um, civil support team and no National Guard. So any response there is going to have to originate um, from Guam at, at the at the closest. Um, they do benefit that Guam has a large, not just uh, National Guard, but you also have a large military contingent with Anderson Air Force Base. Um, more and more U.S. Marines moving into the area as we um, reduce our footprint on Okinawa and uh, the naval naval station there. All right, Amer American Samoa. So this lies, if you remember back to the map from the second slide, this is relatively isolated from the other U.S. territories in the South Pacific. Um, the entire, so in this map, contrary to some others, the way it normally is, all of American Samoa is shown in the inset, with the largest island, Tutuia, being shown in the main portion of the map. Um, with that being said, Tutuia by far the most heavily populated, although there are, you know, the other islands, especially Ofu and Olasega, are populated. And of course, if the population is one or one million, we need to have you know be able to respond to that uh, to those areas. Um, Tutuia itself is only 16 miles long end to end. And of course, you see, again, we put the capital city right there at a at a choke point. But in this case, um, the western half of the island and is by far the most densely populated. Uh, there's not a lot on on the eastern half, uh, but 
The only hospital on the island is there marked with the 198, 198 um, hospital beds, and that is close to their harbor, and that is actually closer to the Pago Pago Airport than the actual star on Pago Pago is. Um, so, uh, and I believe it will be in a future slide. We'll, we'll show kind of where the, um, some of the, uh, the emergency responders will come from on, on Tutuia and you will see what they'd be up against if there was any type of, um, um, any type of response needed. All right, moving on to the Republic of Palau. So again, uh, this one has the main island of Babothwap, uh, Babothwap Airport, um, 7,200 foot runway, decent sized runway. Um, but some of the interesting things here about Palau, uh, again, no civil support team, no National Guard, no military forces to speak of. It's, it's a sovereign nation, but with its defense, the responsibility of the United States. Um, with that being said, there are several islands, Babo Thawal being one and um, Aurora and a couple others. They're actually separate islands linked by roads. So you have those choke points, which also happens to be right there where that hospital is uh, with the, the number 80 there on the right hand, um, right hand inset. Um, so again, it is uh, some areas are have a lot of dense vegetation. Um, the two the two roads that kind of run up Babo um Island, uh, most of the similar to like California and a lot of other islands that have mountainous regions. A lot of the people live along the coastline, and the center is more hilly and a little bit mountainous, and it's uh it's difficult terrain. Uh, so you, you end up on these choke points of one kind of one road in, in this case, it's two roads in two roads out. Um, uh, there we go. Sorry. I was having a little trouble getting the, the thing to click forward here. So now we're on the Republic of the Marshall islands and this, I mean, you just look at the map and, and the map itself is a little overwhelming if you're thinking of trying to get any type of response there for, for any reason. Um, it's over 1,600 miles from east to west in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Um, most islands are just are an atoll, um, usually a ring of islets surrounding a lagoon. Um, pretty much all the airports and seaports are extremely small. Um, of note, with the uh, oh, excuse me, that that's for Micronesia. But anyway, uh, going on, you can see you have Yap Island over there on the west, and that has um, we have a small military presence there, not a permanent military presence, but we are uh, building facilities there, dual use facilities for for use on Yap. But again, sixteen hundred miles east to west, uh, you are that far away from, say, um, Palakir or Pompeii Island there uh, where the capital is. Um, you do see its proximity to Guam, which would be very helpful uh, for any type of response. But again, Guam, um, smaller, it's gonna have its own limited limits and resources. All right, looking at the Federated States of Micronesia. So this is actually two kind of island chains that run parallel. And again, you do see um, some hospital capabilities there on uh, Major Majuro and near Kwajalein Atoll, but not very many. Uh, your, pri your primary method of getting in is going to be uh, Buckholtz Army Airfield on the uh, to the west. And... Um, the international airport um, to the east, kind of to the southeast there. Uh, but a lot of these islands are inhabited, uh, at least to some degree. And uh, I know in the southwest there, Kosre is inhabited. Uh, Iniwatak is 
is inhabited there to the northwest. Um, and so, again, you're very limited in what you can bring to bear in many of these areas. All right, so moving on, and this is where I'm going to get into the area where some of the people that they see burn background are going to think this might think this is a little too generalized, but again, I'm just trying to drive home the point here of how quickly a, an event could um, overwhelm local resources. So this is kind of a typical looking drawing of a hazard zone for a chemical incident or a radiological incident. Um, so, you know, in the, in that hot zone there, in the center, you got the, the black dot in the center. That is your, your incident site in that hot zone there, uh, in there, you're, pro you're conducting search and rescue operations. You're performing mitigation measures that you can. Um, you're identifying any obstacles to the entry point. You're conducting your assessment activities. You're performing monitoring. And um, if, if, if it happens to be a biological incident, that's where you're doing your biological agent sampling is in that hot zone. Um, warm zone, uh, generally safer. Uh, you're doing emergency decon, tech decon, mass casualty decon would generally be done in the warm zone. Um, you would stage your survey teams there before they enter the hot zone, uh, there in the warm zone. But that is still, you know, there should not be civilian personnel in the warm zone. Uh, that should be evacuated completely. Um, cold zone, where you're putting your command posts, other support activities, and your staging area. And again, you want to even though it's called the cold zone, it's theoretically free of contamination. You want to keep civilians out of there because that's, that's where you're going to, that's going to be your outer line of security for uh, your incident. So in the next slide, we're I'm just going to, I'm just taking that and I'm overlaying it over to uh, two case studies here. So here in the case is Saipan, uh, which is, um, uh, you're seeing the primary wind direction based off of the trade winds blowing from uh, east to west. So looking at a detonation kind of right there in the um, center of the island, a det detonation or any type of incident, you're quickly, uh, that's only four miles across and you've cut, off, cut that island in half. And now your fire departments, which are the three uh, essentially red dots they look like on the slides, um, they're all to the south of it. You're one hospitals to the north. So now you have to make a lot of decisions on how you're going to get help to the people within that, that area and either, um, you know, mitigate the contamination, respond to the incident and get them the care that they need. Again, looking over at Tutuia on the right hand side of the screen, as I said, you have your two hospitals, but you could quickly bisect that uh, with with a, uh, an event just north of the airport that I put. Um, your fire station that is there on the southern side is actually really just a crash fire rescue for the airport. Your primary EMS type people are up there closer to the capital in Pago Pago. Um, and that's where your main hospital is as well. So quickly, and again, that southern port portion of the island is the more densely populated Pago Pago, obviously where the most population is, but uh, the Southern portion of the Island is, is heavily populated. And um, you can see an event like this happening in certain areas, how that could impact the airport nearby, the seaport nearby and the hospital nearby could all be impacted. And that doesn't necessarily render them useless, but it is a consideration for any type of response that's going to have to come in there. So pre-positioned stocks, um, the strategic national stockpile maintained by uh, HHS under the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response, uh, they do maintain a stockpile, but those are all CONUS, as well as uh, FEMA's Chemical Stockpile and Emergency Preparedness Program. That is actually only, uh, that's really dedicated to uh, Pueblo, Colorado, Colorado, and Richmond, Kentucky, where they are still demilling chemical warfare agent stockpiles that we've had dating back to World War One, And um, obviously they have 
some resources there that in a um, large public emergency may be able to be used. Um, however, again, you have that tyranny of distance to deal with going from Colorado or Kentucky out to an island in the Pacific. Um, and also, though those types of resources are meant for a specific situation, and now you're kind of leaving those people unprotected that live in those areas. Um, the DOD war reserve material is really not a, a, an option here for this Homeland Defense uh, mission, as far as, and that is my understanding of it. Again, those materials are located in the continental United States, or there's some that are uh, being transported around the world at any given time sh uh, aboard ships. Um, like I said, they're not meant for Homeland Defense and DISCA events. Uh, they could possibly, but you're probably talking a much greater lag time than you think um, if, if you were going to try to rely on any you know, type of uh, mop gear or decontamination equipment or something that might be available um, in the war reserve materials. So what I want to talk about real quick is now we have two different methods of 100% protecting people, um, or I'm sorry, two different methods to respond for the individuals on the, on the islands. One is going to be evacuation. The other is going to be sheltering in place. So, but there's pros and cons to each, and I'll show you that, and I'm going to kind of draw my own conclusion here as to which one I would go with. Uh, the, evacuate, the pros of evacuation um, is that it removes people from the danger area. Um, as those people depart, the infrastructure surrounding is free to support decontamination efforts. So you have you know, less people on the roadway, you need to deliver less food, less clean water, um, deal with um, less uh, waste of all different types. Um, less PPE will be required on the island. Um, people would, you would send people to where they would have access to better medical facilities, ideally. And um, it actually, the evacuation may be more cost efficient for a long-term um, response effort. Uh, speaking to one of the um, consequence management planners out at USERPAC, uh, he ran some numbers a couple years ago to if we had, um, and this was for the island of Oahu, I believe, uh, but he said if we had to do something like a Berlin airlift type scenario where we brought in all the food and water that the people on the island would need, uh, it would be much, much, much cheaper to fly everybody, every resident off the island and house them somewhere in the continental United States and just um, bring them the food there. It would be so much cheaper that it would make more sense to just evacuate the island. Um, the cons of evacuation, uh, here you have the assets that are needed. You need ships, planes, and those assets may end up being exposed to contaminants. The other thing, and probably the biggest one really, is the panic that that's going to create. If, if you're told to evacuate anywhere, um, you, you automatically assume the worst is imminent. You know, um, so that is why a lot of times, in a lot of scenarios, evacuation is not always the immediate response. Um, it also puts a lot of people at greater risk. Namely, the elderly, sick, disabled, um, they're all, and anybody that's hospitalized gets placed at higher risk by moving them somewhere than by, just by staying in place. And again, that's generalization. Obviously, when I, you know, if the contaminant is released outside of a geriatric care facility, those people should probably be evacuated. Just because they're elderly, I'm not saying to leave them to shelter in place. It's not what I'm insinuating here. Um, but in, it, uh, in addition, and this is huge in the Pacific, and it, sh and it should not be understated here, is the cultural and societal implications. Many of these families have lived on these islands for millennia and have never left. Uh, since, since their families arrived on that island, they, they have ties to that island. Um, so it, it it's not going to be an easy thing to just say, hey, you're in danger. Get out of here. Uh, some people 
would rather take the risk and stay where their family had lived. Um, and, you know, there's many cultural and religious beliefs that will play a role in that. And so we, we have to understand that and have an, an idea as if we went to each of these places, how we would confront that type of scenario. Um, and also, uh, neighboring islands may not be an option in certain loca- in certain areas. Um, so th- there are rivalries among these um, these islands, and some people may be too proud to go to the to the next island over. Um, excuse me. Um, so that is just some some of those cultural factors that have to be taken into account um, as we respond. Now, looking at sheltering in place as a uh, as a possible uh, means to mitigate the hazard here. So I did a quick graphic here uh, on the left-hand side using a radiological um, particle type of scenario, uh, you know, a dirty bomb, a radio- radiological dispersion device be- is detonated somewhere on an island. Um, safest thing really in that, in that scenario is to shelter in place in, in most cases. Um, so go inside the home, uh, Get as low as you can, stay away from doors and windows. If you can cover them, cover them, uh, those kinds of things. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a FEMA diagram that uh, shows how to secure a house in the event of a, of a seaburn type of attack. Um, problem with this, that in the Pacific, is that most houses, a lot of houses, do not have basements. Uh, few of them have more than one story. And um, many are very open to the outside air. And they, you know, that's the way they, they keep themselves cool. You know, air conditioning in a lot of these places is, is a high luxury. Um, so, you know, the sealing off the house and sheltering in place may not be the best event, especially in a chemical environment. Um, radiological, again, depending on the type of, uh, the type of isotope that we're, we're dealing with, Still sheltering in place, having a roof over your head sometimes, especially with an alpha or beta emitter, um, will be your number one go-to. So again, here, I haven't really answered any questions here. Uh, it's really just food for thought. Uh, so what, what's the importance here? Why, why, are we, why am I talking about this? So the probability is very low. That there's going to be any type of event. Um, on any of these islands, uh, but the hazard is very, very, very high. So when you do your risk assessment, uh, especially for those of us in the, in the military that uh, you know rate everything from one to four and from A to D for your risk assessment, you come out with your risk assessment code, you're still, you still have a high risk here. Um, it, it is important that we maintain our readiness and access to all of our pos- all possessions, and again, so generalization, we don't possess Palau or RMI or, or anything like that, but anywhere that we need to get to in the Pacific, we have to be able to maintain access. And being able to access them during a seaburn event is important. Um, so along with Hawaiians, Guanamanians and Northern Mariana Islanders are U.S. citizens, and American Samoans are U.S. National, nationals at birth. Bottom line, they're all American. So these are, for the most part, we're talking about American citizens here. Um, and um, Palau, RMI, and the Federated States of Micronesia are close partners and they're strategically vital. So we need to prove to them that we have the capabilities to respond when they need it the most. Uh, look at If you look at the state of world affairs today and you look at a map or you, you look at a globe, and you see where Palau, Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of, Mar- of Micronesia sit, you will take any, any fifth grader could figure out what I mean here by them being close partners and strategically vital. Um, and then I actually did do a couple of years in mortuary affairs, so I can't help but to bring this up on the right-hand side. Um, if you look at these numbers of deaths in the global war on terrorism, um, when you compare these numbers to the per capita numbers, um, American Samoa, for example, is 
higher has the highest per capita death rate and also wounded in action rate, which is not uh, on the slide here, but is higher than any other U.S. state or territory. Um, Guam is in a similar boat. They are uh, among the, the highest. Um, many people in this area, for one reason or another, they do join the U.S. military. And uh, whether it's, you know, it, it may be just to get off their island. It may be for financial reasons. But ultimately, they come and they, they serve honorably in the U.S. military. And, you know, to say, hey, you can serve in the military, but when you need us the most, we, we don't know what we're going to do. Uh, it's not, not an appropriate answer. Um, but with that, I am going to open up the floor to any questions. I think, Brian, you're going to uh, go through and see if there's any questions that I can go ahead and answer. You got it. We have uh, <clears throat> had a few questions come in. And again, let's draw everyone's attention to the top middle of the screen. A little dialogue box where you can enter your questions so we can uh, get John to comment on them. And, and John, as you kind of mentioned in your presentation, this this uh, the presentation itself maybe spawned a lot of thoughts and questions. So some of these questions are are more in that line of kind of thoughts, comments, and just we'll throw them out here and kind of get your response and reaction to them. Okay. Um, so here we go. I'm going to put a couple of them on the screen and we'll, we'll go through them as they were received. So uh, this comment, and I'll, I'll read it before John comments on it, but uh, not sure what slide this exactly was associated with, but hopefully you can recall, John. It's, it says, uh, do you mean hospital beds for DOD, such as uh, the disaster or recovery sites where spare beds and other equipment are stocked or some mechanism maybe to be able to 3D print equipment? Okay, so uh, if I understand the cur the question he's just asking about what what kind of hospital beds I'm referring to in the slides, and what I'm referring to in the slides is actually just existing hospital beds, both uh, in civilian hospital facilities or DoD hospital facilities, where in a major emergency may have to be opened up for uh, you know use by the civilian population, uh, obviously under some military control. But uh, I'm not speaking about any type of uh, spare beds or temporary beds that may exist. Uh, in my research, other than some of the uh, areas in Hawaii and I believe Guam, uh, no other places have um, hospital beds set up or, or any type of uh, the facilities that you see, um, uh, the medical tents that the military sets up, the, often the National Guard is associated with this. They come in and set up, uh, um, you know, we saw this a lot during the pandemic where, you know, have these larger tents set up and they could set up multiple beds inside. Um, most of these islands do not have them, have access to them. So again, when I say hospital beds, I'm, I'm talking about brick and mortar, um, standing up today, hospital beds. Um, and no, I, I was not referring to anything to, th uh, 3d print, um, any type of equipment for the hospital or anything like that. Gotcha. All right. Thanks, John. All right, next question. Uh, same questioner here. Uh, but during your presentation, so you mentioned chemical and radiological, but not biological. Any reason for that? You don't have to answer, but just thinking why biological might not be considered. Like Lord Martin, Matt and Reese would say, error or terror? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, yes, I narrowed down. I, I kind of struck biological out from this particular uh, presentation. Initially, I had it in there. Uh, the main reason being the the transit uh, the method that most biological hazards transmit. Um, generally speaking, with like a, a few uh, you know uh, anthrax being one exception, there um, biological hazards have not been very effective being transmitted through airborne particles for any distance. So when I'm looking at do we shelter in place or do we evacuate? Well, I'm worried more about those radiological particles and those uh, chemical particles that uh, or chemical vapors that may be being carried by the wind, um, not as much the transmission of diseases. That's, that to me would be handled very differently. Again, I acknowledge there are some methods to transmit biological agents, but um, from my understanding, and I'm not an expert in that field, but from my understanding is that is a much lower threat than um, 
chemical or radiological. And that's just my take. Uh, good. All right, next question. Uh, <clears throat> interesting one here. Okay, uh, so this one is again another kind of spawned a question or comment or a, a, a note that you could comment on is that there may soon be the possibility of one hour flights a la Elon Musk. Um, that these might, these one hour flights are, could be used for going to orbit and staying there, waiting for the Earth to rotate and or landing at another destination. How might that kind of, so I guess the, the question I'll pose off that is how might that impact uh, your, your discussion here? Hmm. I well, I think uh, the biggest concern that well, there's a lot of concerns there. But my first <laughs> thought is, uh, so you have a a spaceship that you're going to send into outer space and then land in a contaminated environment. And one of the things I didn't get into as much in this presentation, I kind of wanted to, was some discussions that I've had in the past. And the reason I didn't get into it is I don't know if it's if this uh, decision made this decision thought has changed any over the last five or six years since I've last been involved in these conferences. But um, from a planning perspective, there's a lot of reticence to send any type of aircraft or anything into any type of contaminated environment. So to a lot of people, you essentially lose that asset, if not, tempor if not permanently, at least temporarily, because once it touches the area that's considered contaminated, it's contaminated until somebody can come in and sweep the entire thing and say it's not contaminated. So with that being said, um, if we're concerned that much about a C-130 that was built in you know, 1968 landing in a contaminated environment, Elon Musk's rocket ship, and, and I, my tone, I'm not trying to be dismissive of this. Um, I'm just saying you know, that is probably going to be much more cost prohibitive than um, um, you know what we're already dealing with and we're already concerned about mm -hmm. that's just okay. kind of my take on that my five cents yeah no it's we'll do it. it's all they're asking over here <clears throat> all right next question uh so if china began colonization uh that would occur slowly no and these issues are an issue to what degree if simple blockades or actual incorporation were to occur by them or any of these locations these issues are an issue to what degree if simple blockades are actual. So I'm not sure I, I uh, fully understand the, this question. Um, I don't know if there's a way to uh, get clarification, but yes, that no. would occur slowly. But, um, you know, in my, um, from what I can talk about, about you know, what we're doing out in the PACOM AOR, China is capable of doing this much more quickly than we are. Um, f first and foremost, they have a very centralized government. So when they say, hey, we want to build a fake island in the South China Sea, well, within a year, you have a fake island in the South China Sea. Again, that's an overgeneralization, but um, that's kind of where we're at on them. And there's, you know, we keep talking about, or I hear over and over again that we're in a competition with China, and that's very true. And a lot of that competition is in these Pacific Island nations where China will come into an area, say, East Timor, and will say, hey, we'll, you know, we'll build you this facility. And they're trying to beat out the United States before we could get there and do the same thing. Um, but uh, our actual. That, that, that's perfect. Fine. Yeah, Rob, if, you, if you're able to provide any. Um, Follow up question to kind of clarify that'd be helpful, but otherwise, that, I think it's probably a sufficient response, and we can move on to the next one. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, this question was about, and I had to modify it a bit, but um, just questioning if the if units like there's quick setup homes, um, and it was the links and notes that were included. This describe homes that were, um, I'll say, kind of prefab type homes are, are easy to set up. You kind of drop them in place, fold up the four walls, drop a ceiling on it, and you've got a little shelter um, or a, you know maybe a pretty decent shelter for somebody. So if these kind of quick setup type homes were installed, or what would be the effect, I guess, of these using these type of quick setup homes in multiple locations yeah. like Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, AUS, and Philippines? 
Okay, so that's actually a, uh, a great point. And uh, early on, when I was saying, you know, I'm not going to, I can't get into the international part of it too much. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think that would, for a large scale event that is um, uh, catastrophic, it, I, I think that would have to be something that we would have to consider. And what I would what actually comes to mind if, if anybody here was deployed overseas to Iraq or Afghanistan or Djibouti or whatever is the what came to be called the CHUs, the containerized housing units, and they're essentially a shipping container converted into a housing unit. And you throw you know a couple electric lights and uh, and an air conditioner in there and a heater, and you know you can live in there. You, you have to have communal showers and things like that down down the um, somewhere else in the camp, but uh, something like that uh, I think could be possible. reason I didn't get into it too much is um, mainly that it involves uh, foreign nations, and there's some agreements set up with other foreign nations and, and different packs that are set up and some non-binding agreements, um, particularly with New Zealand and Australia. Um, we have a larger footprint on Australia that is increasing right now up in up in Darwin in Australia, and that may be somewhere where we could um, might have to contract something out with the local nationals to get uh, temporary housing brought in or something like that. I think um, to me, this is probably your best idea uh, as far as if you do decide that you need to evacuate people is um, set up sort of like a camp uh, to bring people temporarily, you know, bring some um, stand alone or I'm sorry, quick, quick to erect medical facilities um, and provide the basic needs until you can get things cleaned up, uh, the contamination mitigated and hopefully completely decontaminated and people and repatriate people. Um, one more thing with that, with any evacuation, um, uh, we deal with it a lot when you're talking about uh, non -com uh, non combatant evacuation operations with like uh, the Department of State when you know they say we want to evacuate all U.S. citizens from a certain area. Um, that uh, the, the tracking of where who go who's going where becomes a, uh, a major logistical lift, and it has to be considered with any plan like this. All right, good. No, thanks, John. All right, uh, so two more questions. I had one, then one more just came in. So second to last question here. Um, are there any examples of natural causes of disasters, such as earthquakes and typhoons, that would provide lessons learned here? You know, that's actually, that's a good question. Um, one, of, one of the issues uh, in CNMI, and I believe it was the island of Saipan, was hit with uh, a typhoon that... Um, so decimated something like 20% of all the buildings on the, uh, I, guess, I guess that's improperly saying that you don't decimate 20%. But anyway, it damaged something like 20% of all facilities, all buildings on that island. And I believe this happened in the early 2000s. And CNMI, their local legislator, actually as a response to this, because of some of the issues they had, um, they voted to authorize the creation of a National Guard. Um, but um, the U.S. Congress wasn't able to fund what they thought they would need. And also there was issues with wh where you place these National Guard facilities uh, on these islands. And um, so something like that may be a lesson learned. Um, I do know uh, there's a lot of examples of natural disasters that we've had to respond to, um, not just on islands, but also uh, um, like, for example, there was a massive earthquake in, in Nepal in, I believe, 2013, and there happened to be U.S. forces training in Nepal, and a lot of people had to be evacuated, and we used our assets to evacuate them. And um, again, you're not talking about any type of contamination, but there's definitely lessons learned there. Uh, some of the, um, there, and this is also where some of the international agreements come into play because. For example, I believe it's uh, Fiji. For you know, that's a smaller island nation, but they are covered under what's called the Franz Agreement, which is uh, I think France, Australia, and New Zealand 
Uh, they have responsibility to help Fiji in any of these events. Um, so there's probably always a large plethora of natural disasters. And I think that's a very good point. Uh, we should look at, you know, what do we do without contamination to, to, um, and I'm sure I'm certain a lot of people are, um, what do we do when there's no contamination to help advise us on how we handle contaminated events? Okay, good. Thanks, John. All right, uh, so in the interest, well, well, we'll keep moving here, but just uh, another question did come in. So we'll try to get both these questions answered and have a short. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. No, no, that, that's fine. Just uh, let you know we had, did have another one kind of trickle in and it was a good one. So now the second to last one, and you mentioned Saipan. Uh, this one says, hey, considering the example of bisecting Saipan, what role could the U.S. Coast Guard play in a response to such an incident? They are experts in disaster response, transport from one port to another over water seems logical. Uh, yes, that's a good question, and the Coast Guard is probably going to have a huge role in any response, uh, particularly uh, the medical response, uh, any evacuation that is absolutely ne necessary at the onset. Um, the one thing I, I don't know for sure is um, the disposition of Coast Guard forces in those regions. I do know that the Coast Guard um, does have a presence in those regions. And they have gone down to some of the uh, associated states, the um, Palau, Marshall Islands, and um, Micronesia to, to do training and, and help do some uh, um, fishery management type of, of things, you know, ch chasing away poachers out of, out of fishing areas and things like that. Um, so I feel, and this is just me talking, having not really talked to anybody in the Coast Guard about this, but from an initial response, they are probably your first people that are, um, that are going to come in with a larger federal capability um, mm -hmm. for both medical and any immediate evacuation needs. All right, great. And then uh, last, kind of get off the stage question. It's a good one. It says, hey, if you could recommend one big thing regarding Seaburn Response Enterprise, shape, anticipate, respond, operate, stabilize, or modernize, et cetera, what would you recommend? My biggest recommendation here would be with the anticipate um, for these islands, and it would be expensive, but uh, pre-staging some materials in, in locations that would be strategic to be able to get to the most people in the quickest amount of time. So take some of those larger islands like uh, Babelthwap, um, and uh, not Kwajalein, but or yes, Kwajalein and and those islands that are quote larger for their surrounding area, and stage as as um, protective uh, clothing and equipment, you know, respirators and things like that for the civilian population that and train the local uh, responders. Which, uh, for example, in Palau, um, Palau has I believe two fire trucks for the whole country. Um, or for their whole, the largest island, at least, Babelthwap, has, I believe, two fire trucks. But regardless, train those local responders on how to give them out and how to train the, you know, everybody that puts on a mask needs to be trained to do it. Um, again, it, it's, it's somewhat, um, might be cost prohibitive, but should the worst happen, it, it could save t uh, hundreds of thousands of lives. And I also think, especially for those associated states, it just sends a, a message that, um, you know, we, we we have your back, for lack of a better way of saying it. Great. Awesome. Thanks, John. That was uh, that was a good final question to, to wrap it all up with. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, well, thanks to everybody for joining. Thank you, John, for the presentation. And we will hope to catch you all next time. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan.